So today with me, I have Dr. Fabian Sanderville, who is an eminent researcher, clinical researcher and physician. I'm delighted to introduce you as Mean Watson, who is a patient who has actually participated in clinical research and can share her experience. And also Ela Gangotra, who is a caregiver and has been actively involved in her daughter's uh, journey through clinical research. So with that, I'd like to um, hand over to Dr. Fabian Sanderville. Dr. Sanderville, what's your experience in terms of um, missed opportunities for engagement with patients of different cultural backgrounds? So I think probably the, probably one of the, the most common uh, engagement opportunities that you miss is the fact that you don't engage the entire family in the discussion is uh, not having the time to, or not giving the time, not have, I mean, having the time, we should all make the time for our patients. It's not giving the adequate amount of time so that we can bring the whole family into the discussion, um, especially when it comes to one of, uh, one of these more critical diagnoses like both of our patient panelists we have today. Um, it's not just a one person situation, it's, it's a, a gigantic ripple effect. Um, and the clinical trial can have that effect because there's more visits, there's more procedures that have to be done, there's diaries that have to be completed. So, so that is important. And if we don't do that, the, the patients are gonna be engaged because one of their relatives did not get it, you know? And then they're like, well, why are you doing this? This isn't, isn't going to work for you. And then they have this in the back of their, their, their head all the time, and it might uh, not encourage the patient to continue on. So that's very important. And I think also, Claire, is how much time we dedicate to our patients, right? Really quick uh, anecdote. Uh, I was just in travel yesterday, and the, the guy that dropped me off at my building said, you know, my doctor worked in this building, but he retired, and I really miss him. And I said, why do you miss your doctor? You know who the hell I was, right? And he said, why do you miss your doctor? And he said, because he gave me a lot of time. He really talked to me. And that's an old school, right, thing that, that people don't do anymore. And I thought to myself and I whispered to the colleague that was in my car and I said, see, that's why research is so awesome because we have more time for our patients. We give them the amount of time that they need. And that's why in our clinic and other clinics like us are successful because we give the patients the time that they need. And, and that's so important to educate our patients and make them want to come into the study some more. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, when you, when you pull those three things together, it's about having appropriate information, time to share that information, and also ensuring that you know, that information is provided in multiple different languages and formats that's suitable for the whole family. It's often a family decision. If not, you know, in many instances, it's the matriarch of the family's decision. You know, usually that is the role that has mm -hmm. the most um, persuasive power in the family, if you like. And so it's really important that we're including um, those different family roles and, and friends in the whole conversation. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting. I received um, a letter this week around my COVID vaccine. I've actually already had mine because I participated in a clinical trial for, for one. However, I did note that I received the letter and a supplementary form, and it had no less than 12 languages on the supplementary form to wow. say, if you do not understand this letter, please you know, contact and, and to gain that in your own language. And it really made me think about how frequently we use multiple languages in our documentation that we're sharing with patients, because that is a very, very small piece that we could do that is so much more enabling, I think, for me to struggle through um, information that is complex and challenging in a different language, a second or possibly even third language, I think could, is, is hugely challenging for patients. It's a missed opportunity, it really is. Um, I, I say to my staff, you know, when, when a patient calls into the office, make sure you talk to the patient in their native tongue that they're comfortable in. I'm sick. I don't want to try and, tra and interpret everything that's being said in one language into my native tongue to say, what does that really mean? I want to have that real true connection with my provider of sort, you know, medical assistant, nurse practitioner, whoever it is that understands me, not to say really interpret because you lose that connection once again. So 
that is part of this important thing. So I'm glad that you brought that up, that having mm -hmm. the ability to have multiple languages available mm -hmm. was, was offered to you. Mm, fantastic. And I think as industry, what we can also take away is that it's clear from what Elia and Yasmin have said that time with the physician is absolutely critical. From your anecdote about, you know, your, your elevator journey uh, with, with a patient. So let's make that time as useful and effective as possible. Let's give the sites the tools that they need, the information resources that they need to be able to have a really effective conversation during that time. You know, I think that's that's a piece that we in industry can do to, to improve that. And I, I want to continue on on that theme, if that's okay, with you, Fabian, because I know that you've gone to a lot of effort mm -hmm. in order to engage your community. Um, you are an Emmy awarded uh, TV celebrity, in fact, in your community, um, which is phenomenal that you have taken clinical research to your community in that way. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about what made you um, think about reaching out to your patients and, and what different steps did you take to reach out and what's been your success, particularly, I'm very interested about your, your TV show in particular. Sure. So, so I think the reason why I started this is because when I first started ECRI, uh, the amount of, of Hispanic patients that were coming in was very little. And when they did come in, that uh, that I did talk to them, and I gave them the the medications, and I gave them uh, the compensation for their time and travel, they did not understand why. You know why? You know what's the catch? This looks too good to be true. Um, explain to me why you're doing this. So it, it, it hit me at that moment that I realized people don't understand what research is and how valuable it is. And I'm a big proponent of reminding people that research is a complement to medicine. There's some activities that can't be done through normal practice because it's not covered by insurance, it's not available, and we have those tools to do it. So at that moment, I said, we need to find another way to communicate to people. Um, five years ago, I started to do the news segment. So every Thursday evening at the six o'clock news, I gave a two minute segment on the, they said, whatever you want. So it always going to sneak in research in there to tell people what it was, what these trials were, what the diagnoses were. And then it wasn't enough time. People were interested and were calling, asking for more information. So I started, uh, the foundation so that I could uh, beg and plead sponsors for funding and, and opportunities for this because I knew that this was what we needed to do, right? You know, the technology of social media is great, but TV and radio still hits a lot of people, right? So we decided to launch our TV show. Now we're starting year three and we have 60,000 people that watch us every Saturday morning. We can't stop with that. So we're continuing this effort because people are becoming more educated. They're calling us with better questions and they're referring their relatives to understand what to ask for when they go see a doctor to see if research is available. So that is the home run that I was hoping for, but we have a lot more innings to go. Truly amazing. Yeah. And and are those stored, you know, they're on TV. Are they on YouTube and things like that as well? Can you access Yes, them absolutely. Them? Absolutely. Awesome. So awesome. our show is called Tu Salud, Tu Familia, which means in Spanish, your health, your family. So we have a, um, a Facebook page. We have a YouTube channel. We um, have our website, tusaludtufamilia.com. You know, interestingly enough, Claire, we also have Twitter. But the Hispanic community doesn't use Twitter very much. Uh -huh. It's not a thing that we like to use, right? Twitter has a lot more newsy stuff, right? right. We want to get other ways of getting information. So, so that's why Facebook is so good for us. And so is YouTube, right? So that's where you can find our shows. You can find clips of it. You can find the entire show. You can now, if you go onto YouTube, you can actually click the little widget and pick the language that you want to. So you can actually wow. read the English or whatever language you want, uh, subtitles underneath. So please watch it. There's 80 shows out there that there's something for your patients. Please providers, please sponsors, use the content in there. Just tell me, you don't have to ask for my permission. Just tell me that you're going to use it so you can chop it up and use it so that I know that it's actually being put to good use. 
That's awesome. Thank you so much, Fabian. That, that's just incredible. And absolutely, for the whole audience, please do go and check that out. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal.